wasn't him there. It's chapter 4. I hope that helps. Are you listening carefully if you're not reading? In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season, correct? Rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Much better than a Nobel Prize. Thanks, Luke. Luke, you may have to turn on the presenter. Come on? No, the presenter. Oh, yeah. Good morning, church. Good morning. It's uh, always great to be uh, here with you today. Uh, it's great to have uh, Winnie with us as well, our, uh, our new au pair from Taiwan. If you haven't had the chance to say hello to her, I'm sure she'd uh, be keen to practice her English with you. So, um, by all means, do say hello. Um, it is great to be with you today. Um, also, just wanted to let you know as well that it may be one of the last times that Jerry is here with us. Um, Jerry deploys to the Middle East in September. Um, so, uh, by all means, please do uh, go out and tell Jerry that you'd um, you be praying for her during that time and uh, for her family, we'd certainly appreciate that. Well, so today we're talking about finishing pretty. Finishing pretty, Carolyn wants that picture it looks like. So. But before I get into that, today I want to read you a story about a group of friends that wanted to take part in one of those big 26 mile races. You know what they are, don't you? The marathon. It was said that this group of friends ran together for over a year preparing for the meet. They're not trying to be big competitors in this race. They simply enjoyed running together and for them this was going to be a fun thing to do together. And most of these people were men, but there was one woman among them named Peg. They all started off at the starting line together, and as the day wore on, they found themselves a mere mile from the finish line. Enjoying the moment, they began to banter back and forth about the fact that there'd be lots of cameras and video recorders capturing the moment they made it to the end. And they began to talk about how they would finish the race. And one of the men looked over at Peg and asked, Hey Peg, how are you going to finish? Peg pulled out a tube of lipstick out of her pocket and held it up and replied, I'm going to finish pretty. <laughs> pretty good effort to carry lipstick for 26 miles, I reckon. <laughs> See, finishing pretty, you know what she was saying by saying that? What she was saying is she wasn't satisfied simply crossing the finish line. She wanted to look pretty for the cameras. She wanted to look good when she finished the course. And that's the kind of what Paul was saying in our text this morning as well. It wasn't enough for him simply to cross the finish line. He wanted to look good when he did so. Let's read again from 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 to 8. Paul says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, 
which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You see, when we love Jesus, it's not simply enough to get by in your faith. It's not enough to simply cross the finish line. It's not enough just to do enough to get into heaven. There are too many believers that get that impression that all it's about is getting baptised in the Christ and attending Sunday, Sunday worship for an hour a week. And that's all there is to their faith. But that's not the way God looks at it. One of my favourite verses in Scripture, in fact, is 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. It says this, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. <coughs> you see, God is looking for someone. He's looking for someone who will be loyal to him. Someone who wants to honour him and someone who wants to look good at the finish line and who desires to finish pretty. <clears throat> now, how do we do that? How do we finish pretty? In Matthew 25, Jesus told the parable of a man who gave each of his servants talents and then went away on a trip for a while. Now, from Matthew 25, verses 19 and 21, it says, After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, there's a lot in that small passage that we can learn from. But what I want to zero in on is one phrase in that. It's simply the phrase that says, well done, good and faithful servant. For those who love Jesus, that's what we all want to hear. It's not enough just to get by. We want to cross the finish line and hear God call our name, your name and my name, and say, well done. That's what it means to finish pretty in our faith journey. But now how do we do that? How do we finish pretty? Well, first, we need to start by realising the significance of our part in God's plan. See, Paul tells Timothy, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to miss. From 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 to 4. Now, what has that got to do with you? Well, you are the defensive wall that stands against itching ears. Where you stand and what you stand for can curb the influence of people that want their ears scratched. You are, in fact, the standard bearer for the church. You stand in the gap and protect God's church against evil. I've always been struck by this phrase in the book of Judges 2, verse 7. It says, The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. See, what the passage says is that as long as Joshua and the elders who outlived him the people served God. But once those leaders died off, it seems the folks started getting itching ears and fell back into paganism and a pagan lifestyle that angered God. So God said, well, if you want to live your life without me, go ahead. I'll just lift my hand of protection off your lives and let's see how well things turn out for you. Without God protecting them, their enemies would come in and harass them and steal from them and beat them into the dust. And after a while, the folks began to think that wasn't the smartest thing I ever did. And they turned back to God and asked for forgiveness and prayed for him to deliver them. Then God would send a judge to defeat their enemies and Israel would be faithful to God as long as that judge lived. But note this from, from Judges 2 verse 19. It tells us this. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt 
than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshipping them. They refuse to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. Now notice, as long as godly men stood up for God, the people obeyed God. But when those leaders died, that's when people got itchy ears. It's where folks stood and what they stood for that made all the difference. So if you ever get the feeling that your voice is unimportant or that your influence for Christ has no value, remember that. Remember that there are people watching you and remember that what you say and what you believe can keep others from buying into the morality of our age. So I was born back in the 1980s, 1981. I'm here to tell you I've seen our nation grow progressively more wicked over my lifetime. You know, there's a lot of people in this room, a lot older than me, that could probably say that they've seen that degeneration so much more. See, we live in a particularly evil age. An age where folks defend immorality like it is moral to do so. I'll say that again, where an age where folks defend immorality like it is moral to do so. They embrace wickedness like abortion and living together and homosexuality and even this bizarre concept of transgenderism. And there are people out there who will defend stuff like that like it's a badge of honour. Yours may be the only voice that's going to stop some folks from embracing this kind of evil. Now taking a stand for righteousness is not always going to be easy. Paul told Timothy, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 3. That means there will be lots of folks that won't like it when you tell them something is wrong with what they believe. Jesus told us this was going to happen. In Matthew 5, verses 10 to 12, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you. See, there will be people who won't endure sound teaching or doctrine. So when you stand up and say that's not right, you can expect that they'll give you a hard time. In fact, if you do your faith right, you will face opposition. But you know what? If you face opposition, Jesus is standing back saying, great, well done, good and faithful servant. Your reward is going to be great in heaven. You're going across the finish line looking pretty good to me. And that's what's important. So note that when you take your stand for Jesus, there are going to be folks that may give you a hard time. But the important thing is that we need to be careful about what we do. And it's not just where we stand, but it's how we stand for Christ. 2 Timothy 2 verses 24 to 26 tells us, And the Lord's servants... The Lord's servant may, must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive, captive to do his will. That's why I for a show of hands, how many of you have ever been on Facebook? We're doing it now. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. See, I'm on Facebook, and I've noticed that there are a lot of folks on there who get really passionate about things like politics and religion, right? And sometimes if you disagree with them, they can say some really nasty things about you. They'll accuse people of dishonesty, deceit, heresy, etc. And they can be rude, insulting, 
and really, really offensive. Now, several people I know on Facebook, that are on Facebook, have had that exact experience. And do you know what most people's first impulse is when these folks get nasty? Get nasty back. Bingo. That's right. They want to insult them back. And you know what? They can get really good at it because they've been practicing. But then I read Paul's words and which say this, the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone. And we say, oh, come on. Able to teach, not resentful. And you say, but I want to be resentful. Those who oppose him must be, must, he, sorry, those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. And we say, seriously? But that's what we're called to do. <laughs> now, my first thought when I read Paul's words is this. Don't ever wrestle with a pig because you'll both get dirty but the pig will probably enjoy it. <laughs> now I like that. I can see that. And we can easily go to the default positions of these people are pigs. They're crude, rude and despicable. And they deserve to get their lunch handed to them. But that's not what Paul is saying. In fact, he probably wouldn't approve of me thinking of these folks as pigs either. No, when these folks get nasty, we're supposed to work hard to get to them, to get them to come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 26. In other words, they're not pigs. In fact, in the eyes of God, there's a lot of times that I'm not all that much difference to them what they are. Their problem is that they've lost Sorry. Their problem is that they are often lost people who may very well go to hell if I don't handle things the right way. To those who oppose him must be must those who oppose him he must gently instruct. Why? In the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. You see, that's where the finish line is. The finish line is all about bringing as many people into the kingdom as I can by caring whether or not they belong to God or not. There's an illustration of a true, there's a true story of a famous preacher who once talked a skeptic into attending church for four Sundays to hear his sermons on why he should become a Christian. He told the atheist he wanted his opinion on the sermons. And sure unto his word, the skeptic came and listened intently to the messages. After the fourth message, he came to the preacher saying he wanted to become a Christian. The preacher was delighted and could not resist asking which of the four sermons brought him to this decision. The skeptic replied, your sermons were helpful, but they were not what finally persuaded me. He said that after church one Sunday, as he was helping an elderly lady on a slippery walk, she looked up into his face and said, I wonder if you know my Saviour Jesus Christ. He's everything in the world to me. I would like you to know him too. And that's what, was, what changed the atheist mind. And that's what it's all about. Running our race isn't about being good at arguing about Christ. It's all about telling people how much Jesus means to us. When we share our love of Christ, that's the way we finish pretty for Jesus. Do you know in athletics, the term personal best refers to those who compete as competing not only against other competitors, but also against their own past records. A runner in a 100-yard dash, for example, could come in last, but they could still beat their own past record in that event. When they do that, it's said that they beat their personal best. When they do that, they look good and they finish pretty. You see, that's what God is focused on. God is not focused on whether you come in first. What God is looking at is your determination to cross the finish line and to see you look good when you do so.
Let me close this morning with a story. The year was 1980 and Bill Broadhurst began training for the 10 kilometer Pepsi Challenge in Omaha, Nebraska. His major reason for wanting to be in this race was that Bill Rogers, a nationally known runner, was also competing in the challenge. And Broadhurst wanted to be able to tell others that he had run in a race besides the great Bill Rogers. Now Broadhurst had not run since high school. As a teen he had developed an aneurysm that had so damaged his body that his doctors doubted he'd ever walk, let alone run. By sheer force of will he eventually did learn to walk. But in order to do that he had to put one foot down and drag the other foot behind him. His running was not much different. One foot forward, drag the other. One foot forward, drag the other. And that was how Broadhurst ran in this 10 kilometer race. The gun went off, hundreds of competitors trotted off and Bill slowly followed. For a while he could still see them in the distance. And the crowds cheering him on for a while. Eventually he heard the sounds of the feet coming back towards him and towards the finish line. As time dragged on, the crowds gradually disappeared and Bill ran on alone towards the halfway point. No one was there as he put his hands on the marker just to make sure that there was no question that he had made it to this objective. Then he turned around and made his way back toward the finish line. But he was a forgotten man. The police stayed with him for a while, but then they had to leave to return to their duties. It said that children came out to taunt and imitate him as he painfully made his way on. The markers that had been laid out, the cause had now been taken down, but Broadhurst trudged onto the goal. Finally, it was in sight. The crowds had all disappeared, and all that was left was a line that, had paint, that was painted on the street. But Bill Broadhurst struggled on with no one to watch his victory over his personal obstacles. As he crossed the line several hours after he began the race. Then out of the alley he could hear a commotion. As he turned he heard the sound of applause and cheering. And out of that alley came several of the race's participants, led by Bill Rogers. Rushing forward, they took Broadhurst up onto their shoulders and carried him for a distance, then set him down. Then Bill Rogers took the medal he had won from around his own neck and placed it over the head of Bill Broadhurst, saying, you're the real winner of this race. See, Bill Broadhurst didn't finish first, but he finished well. And he looked good to the one man that he admired the most. In the same way, it doesn't matter if we finish first or last. When we cross that final finish line, all that will matter is that we finish well and that we look good to the Jesus we love. Let me close with this scripture again from 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8. Paul wrote, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also all who have longed for his appearing. May God bless you as you go forward to reach the goal. Thank you.